Welcome back to RGR. We are continuing our path down that road that is uh, often winding for home brewing. Uh, we're going to continue today talking about your favorite thing, thing that you have to do to make any beer, a fermentation vessel. Mike Munhall is the man who knows more than I do about this pastime, but we're going to have a good time talking. How are you, Mike? Yeah, good. How are you? I'm, uh, I'm awake. And, you look good. Uh, have you been working out? You know, every now and then. I try uh, to put okay. stuff up and don't look at this or this. It's the same shirt. I know. Way to point it out. I like your, I like your hat. Now it's on your head this time. That's yeah, great. Yeah, thanks. Um, yes, folks, we batch record some of these. Um, <laughs> and the way that this works, uh, after the last time that we were together uh, talking about disasters, we, we actually got into a topic that I think deserves some serious attention a little bit too. And that is whether you're brand new into the hobby or uh, somebody like me that took a long hiatus and then came back to what is a pretty new world compared to what it was 15 years ago, uh, or if you're somebody that's really looking to up their game, what you do with your wart once it's produced is one of the keys to making sure that you get a good product to drink at the end. And there are a number of styles of fermentation vessel that I think are ever evolving first, but are definitely leaning towards the higher end in more cases. And I don't know that that's necessarily something that has to happen for today's homebrew. No, I don't think so. I mean, you, uh, yeah, there's so many options out there on what to ferment your wort in, you know, from basic bottle or a plastic bucket, right, to uh, which is what we generally all started with five or 10 years ago. That's all we had, right, uh, to carboys, glass carboys or plastic carboys. And now we've got like the Mac Daddy fermentation vessel like that you have with that spike, um, you know, part that's, of the problem. Uh, it, it, it's pricey, but man, it sure is nice, isn't it? Right. It, it is. And for me, it's about the one thing that I'm always petrified of. And it actually has never happened to me. I've never had a contaminated batch. I'm really careful about cleaning pre. And I know you are, you're, you're even better than I am, but it hasn't happened, but I'm not willing to let it. So the ability right. to, to not just wash, but to scrub down to really attack the vessel itself to make sure that it's clean. Um, that's something that I, I opted to go to the stainless steel because I feel like it could take a beating that I need to give it. Right. But, right. And I think the whole, the whole market is kind of stacked towards the higher end now. So it makes things harder if you are a new brewer to get into it, but that's why we wanted to run through today. And like you started with at the basics, we all started with this is just a, a food grade plastic bucket is really all you need. You need to be able to cover it is the key. Cover it, uh, get an airlock in there, um, you know, on there. And, but you know what? It's simple. It's a no brainer, right? Um, it, it's cheap and there's nothing wrong with it. You know, the, the only downside to a plastic bucket, in my opinion, is uh, uh, just that it's just for primary fermentation, right? That plastic isn't completely uh, impermeable to air and oxygen, right? Over time. Um, if you were going to leave a beer in there for a couple of months, it's a chance of introducing some oxygen, um, yeah. you know, and, and, but you know, it's simple and it's cheap. Can't go wrong. Yeah. You know, um, and, and oxygen is the culprit folks. If you get a beer that tastes uh, a little bit of cardboard or just generally lifeless, that's generally an oxidation problem that got in there. And especially if you're doing like trying to do a lager where you have fermentation times that are so much longer, it's not the greatest option. So the next viable one is, like you said, the classic, the, the one that we got into in our last session that I, I have a tendency to destroy. And this is a serious issue, too, because glass carboys are narrow at the neck. They're super heavy. They're easy to drop. And when you do, they create shards that can cause not surface cuts, but like deep lacerations that can hurt people. Oh yeah, that stuff can kill you, especially when you have five gallons of liquid in there, right? If you drop that on your foot or something, oh man, that's that's nuts. Um, you know, it, it's but you know, they're uh, I don't like the skinny neck ones. Um, in fact, I'm not even sure if I've ever if I've seen those. You know, in the last few years, I think you know for glass carboys, generally you're going to get one of those wide mouth ones, right? That's actually what I use pretty regularly right now. Um, but uh, yeah, glass is. You know, it's good. It, it's easy to clean unless you've got those, uh, the little skinny neck ones. Um, uh, you know, they they don't retain 
like that house flavor, right? Plastic absorbs um, that, you know, the smell of whatever you had in there last, right? Which is okay. You know, I mean, it's not necessarily going to come through in the next batch of beer that you make, but you know, it's still there, but glass is easy to clean. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's impermeable to um, gases. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it works, you know, uh, you just have to be careful of that glass. Yeah. It's, it's, it's user error that is the problem with it, right? Yeah. Um, they're not easy to move because the glass has got some heft to it as well as the 40 plus pounds of whatever liquid you have in it. So yeah. I think that's an issue, but from the time that I, I took my hiatus to when I came back is I walked into this new world, what, four years ago now that has all kinds of variations and one that you use fairly often, um, that I nearly bought at, at the beginning was one of the, the wide mouth PT fermenters and are do you still use those and, and how happy are you with them uh, i have them um they're basically if i need them i'll use them um you know it, it's basically all the advantages of a wide mouth glass carboy but in plastic right um so it's not a bucket but mm-hmm. yeah it's pretty comparable to a bucket um just as easy to clean um, and i think the newer bottles that they've been making the last five years or so are less susceptible susceptible to um, uh, gases and oxygen permeating through the plastic, um, you know. So I, I think they're absolutely fine, right? Any of these options, any of these vessels we've talked about so far, perfectly viable option. It really comes down to preference. Um, but yeah, I do have some. Um, I'm not using them as often just because I have, you know, the catalyst, which is probably what we're going to be talking about next, right? Um, you know, and that works well enough for me, um, but also has its disadvantages. But yeah, um, you use the catalyst for a little while too, right? Yeah, I still do, uh, especially if it's not something that that I need to either crash or, or run real warm, like the Vike strains. Um, but even before that, I don't think I've ever owned one. I'm, I'm not sure if you have, but there are a couple of steps before you get to the catalyst. The catalyst, in terms of a conical that's non-stainless, is kind of the Cadillac. You have you have the Zillas, the firm Zilla. You have the Spiedels, if I'm saying that correctly. Thank you, Germans, for anyone correcting my pronunciations. Um, but these are, again, the goal being low oxygen permeation, but still that shape that allows you to drop out the yeast and you know, either collect or expend it. Uh, so that you can clear up the beer. And those are lower cost. Um, honestly, they're on par with the carboys and you still get the shape and the collection ability. Um, I would, if I were starting over, that's probably where I would look first right now. Sure. Yeah, I think, uh, if, you know, the price point, if you're just going to get started, um, you're not spending too much more money on something like that than you would be on um, a couple glass carboys or, you know, a couple buckets, whatever. Right. Yeah. So um, no, I think it's perfect, perfectly reasonable option. Uh, of course, you're not going to start off, you know, uh, jumping right in with a spike conical, um, no. you know, so you've got, you're going to want to start something a little simpler, a little bit more affordable. Mm-hmm. And that would be, that would be it. There's a lot of options out there. Yeah. And that's probably what I would do now. Now for me coming back in a few years ago, knowing that I was not, <laughs> I had gone through the bucket phase earlier in my life and come back to the hobby at that point. And so I decided to go straight into the catalyst uh, as my first piece of equipment to tell you the truth. When I started rebuilding my system, I got a burner from you and a, a mash ton from you. Thank you very much. Still have those. And then I bought the, the catalyst. Now the catalyst is for those who don't know is again, uh, a conical, but it is made out of Triton. So it's not permeable to flavor or oxygen. Uh, it is a significant plasticized material, but it is that uh, that 45 degree ish rough hit or miss um, in terms of a conical that allows you to do collection as well. That's what intrigued me the most because that's something I hadn't done until this point. Yeah, and uh, you know, on paper, that is exactly what I liked about it as as well, right? So you got the conical shape. So uh, attach a jar to the bottom. You can collect your yeast, and then that valve that you can just close up. And then it becomes a secondary, just like that, right? Yep. Never worked that way for me, right? Nope. So I'm still using the catalyst just because I have it and it's a good vessel to ferment in. Um, but at the end of the day, I use it just like I would a plastic carboy or glass carboy. I actually rack out of it into secondary, um, you know, as opposed to, you know, I think what, like I just mentioned, the idea is collect the yeast, all the other trube, close that valve. You can remove that jar. And um, then they have an attachment that you can put back underneath there where the jar was. 
and um, drain into your, you know, it, it becomes a secondary after you close that valve, open it back up and drain it off into your keg. Mm-hmm. Um, but the things that didn't work for me on the catalyst or don't, and the reason why I'm using it just like a carboy is um, I don't like that when I open that valve back up, oxygen goes through it, right? Like a big giant, you know, what, you know, the, whatever the volume <laughs> is in that jar, basically it can go right back up through there. And I don't like that. Right. It's like, I haven't figured out a way to not introduce that oxygen shooting back up through the, uh, through the beer at that point. Uh, the other problem with the catalyst, in my opinion, is, um, that jar is really hard to get off, right? It's, mm-hmm. if you're trying to unscrew that jar, I don't know if you experience this yourself, Ryan, but when I'm unscrewing that jar, that whole bulkhead starts coming off. It's not the jar. And, um, it's the valve assembly you're talking about, right? Uh, yes. Basically that bulkhead that's, uh, in, in between the, the jar and the fermenter itself. So anyway, what I would end up doing is just closing that valve and then leaving the jar on there. Um, so that's fine. But you know, what happens is, um, if that yeast isn't completely done, you are basically just building a little tiny bomb yeah. underneath your fermenter. And so between all those things, it's like, I, I like the shape because it really collects all that true down into that little narrow neck. But, uh, I really just use it, uh, just like a regular conical or excuse me, like a regular glass or plastic fermenter. Yeah. And I just rack out of the top. So see now I, I've gone a couple of different ways, both in technique and I've made a couple of upgrades after the initial run. And I hear that they're working on the catalyst too, which should address some of this, these things natively. Um, what they did come out with is a specific set uh, that you can purchase as an add-on to add uh, a filler valve so you don't have to fill from the bottom. So what I would then do is I went from a standard ball jar to a 32-ounce wide mouth jar. I never took it off. When it got down to where I wanted to separate, if I was worried about autolysis or anything with that yeast having fallen all the way out, I would close the valve. I would still crack it back open every day or so, like you said, so you don't build back pressure in the, in the lower vessel. It is a three inch butterfly. And that's really nice. Even compared to the two inch that I have on the spike, it doesn't, doesn't have to compact as much when you just have that three inch. So that part's nice. It is all plasticized. So there is some wear issues that will eventually crop up. I haven't had any of those, but that ability to actually like sample or uh, fill kegs off of a secondary port allows you to bypass all of that. So you just close the valve or, you know, how, however you're going to do it. Some people take it off, uh, take the true and, and the and yeast, and get rid of that and fill back up with distilled water. So there's a volume of water rather than air in there in case the valve leaks or anything. But then same thing, you're, you're talking about the top half of the conical vessel. You can fill off the bottom just a half inch off of the valve itself and get all that clear wort back out of there when you're done. And that works really well. But here's the rub. It's not standard. It's an upgrade. It's an additional cost to buy the kit. And this is the part that was really hard for me. You have to go drill a hole in a $200 conical you just bought. Right. (laughs) Right. And it's plastic. Right. Easy. Yeah. Right. So it's it's plastic, right? I mean, drilling a hole is drilling a hole, but that's really easy. That hole is easy to mess up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. that's, uh, That's a rough one. Yeah, it was difficult. I have to say it took a lot of planning and I wanted to be very careful. That Triton material is plastic. It is very hard though. So you don't have to deal with like the dimpling effect, how you can get the oval shape of that from the drill bit when it puckers. I didn't have any of that, but I did. I mass taped it off. I tried to do everything to keep any kind of cracking. Uh, And honestly, it went flawlessly in both of my catalysts have that valve installed and they work great. Um, and like I said, I, I do believe that craft of brew, uh, is working on them. This is not a commercial for the catalyst folks. This is an honest review of, for me, 30 batches through each of mine. Um, I don't know about you, but high volume that we've had experience with that particular fermenter. Yeah. yeah I've been using mine for, yeah, a good two or three years now, at least. Oh, it's gotta be three years at least. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I'm still using it. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it is, it, it's a good fermenter. It's just a, um, just a couple things that are a little short sighted on that one, I think. Yeah. And yeah. hopefully the, the second version of it will come around. In fact, I'm going to get you one of mine. So you have that valve 
because um, I won't ask you to drill through anything either. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so yeah. that brings us to the Mac Daddy, and that's that's because it's highly highly cost inefficient to buy a stainless conical. I'm now seven batches into using the spike conical. Uh, and if you guys missed it, one of the first videos I did in the series uh, about the spike, and that's a separate playlist here on the channel on RGR Craft, um, I went through my purchasing process of what I got in terms of accessories, what I got in terms of the base. I just went with a five because quite frankly, the older I get, the less beer I need to drink. So it needs to be higher quality and less volume. Uh, so I went with the five gallon, but the cost is significant. And that's the problem with stainless. But that said, I don't have to take, you know, um, the soft side of a scotch pad into the inside of the conical to not scratch it, not develop anything. Um, I can blast that thing with a pressure washer if I wanted to. Um, what I actually do is a right angle drill with a drill pad, uh, scrub pad on it. And that cleans it better than anything ever. And sure. none the worse for wear. Um, it is ease of use. It is a permanent installation for me. Um, what they tell you when you buy that particular product, and it's the same thing uh, for some of the others. I know more beers had their own line. I know SS Brewtech has theirs. You don't want to carry them by the welded on handles when they're full. They're not designed for that kind of load. So it makes it very difficult. Once you feel it to move it, you really want to have it in a set place. Um, and that's why controlling the temperature is difficult. People either do glycol or they do a fermentation chamber like I have, where you fill it to its destination and it stays there. And that I have to say has, has become uh, the standard for me to the point that um, as long as I do the threads on my mason jar or like I've done and gone to upgrade to a sight glass, um, it allows you to then just cap off and build a little bit of pressure. It will take up to 15. Um, I usually don't go above seven, but it gives you uh, the start of carbonation. It helps that clear and you can cold crash right in the vessel. Once you've filled the headspace with, seven PSI of uh, CO2 volume, you can then cold crash 20 degrees and not have that suck factor, which is still a problem with any of the other vessels, including the catalyst, that you have to have some volume or some way to control what's coming back into the vessel if you cold crash. Um, and that's something that we'll probably talk about here coming in, in an upcoming episode because cold crashing, I think, is one of the underestimated techniques to use to really improve the taste that you get out of your beer uh it's something that i do on every batch now yeah and i and in the winter that's really easy for me to do because i have a really cold part of my basement no problem right you know but it's uh <laughs> um yeah it, it, i know we're talking about vessels right now but just fermentation temperature in general is pretty important right so cold crashing is part of that um, but yeah, that's, uh, again, you're, we're, we're, you get into, um, that's getting into like kind of advanced territory, uh, mm -hmm. because of the cost, um, and because of just like you said, right. So, um, your vessel basically just stays where it is mine. I fill it wherever I'm brewing, whether it's on the deck or my garage, and then I carry it down into my basement here. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, I mean, that's actually just additional expense, additional, you know, things that you have to think about if you're going to keep your fermenter in one single place, um, you know, but uh, so yeah, my options for cold crashing are completely different than yours because yeah. of those reasons, um, you know, so I, I'm moving my beer around, you're keeping it in a single place. Yeah. As long as my fridge keeps running, which is another upcoming yeah. episode here. Yeah, us. different story there. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's finish here, though, because I think of all the options, um, where do you think the sweet spot is? Not only for a beginner, obviously, would probably be towards the lower end, but in terms of bang for your buck, of all these things that you could buy to, to ferment your warden, where would you go? You know, my opinion, um, it, it all comes down to personal preference, right? If a bucket works for you, man, it's cheap. It works, you know, uh, award-winning beers are made in buckets mm -hmm. all the time. Uh, the sweet spot for me would be, you know, not like a spike stainless steel conical um, or a bucket, but it would be something like a, um, a catalyst, which is reasonably affordable for Joe Brewer like me, um, but addresses those problems we talked about, 
right? It doesn't have to be the catalyst. I know there's other products on the market. Um, I haven't done any market research lately on that stuff, right? Like I said, my conical or my spike or my spike, my catalyst works fine for me right now, but um, definitely room for improvement. But I think uh, some something along the lines of the catalyst that addresses the problems we talked about is probably the sweet spot in my opinion. What about you? What do you think? Yeah, I mean that that's it. If if you are especially somebody who wants to like I, I ferment basically one at most two batches at a time. There are people that are constantly rotating so much beer through their keezers that they have to have four and five fermenters going. And so clearly for that cost alone, uh, I would think that it has to be somewhere down between the 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 Firmzilla Spiedel uh catalyst area and again it has to address what you want to do um and i i do look forward to new designs from uh three different companies one already has a a volume that you can pressurize a plasticized fermenter with so that you can then cold crash i think that's very uh forward thinking i think that's going to be a key going forward and yeah maybe that's what we'll do is we'll just uh we'll get some samples in folks and we'll We'll run through some options with you here in a future show, but that's where we are today. So um, any parting thoughts before I wrap it up? I don't think so. Um, you know, this got me thinking about uh, my next upgrade now, you know, <laughs> this is, this is an area where I could probably do better, um, you know, as my vessels. But uh, now that I'm thinking about it, I've got my eye on that grandfather fermentation chamber or vessel, right? Ah, uh, um, Yeah. I'm work. I'm using the grandfather. I blew, I brew exclusively on that now. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, having, uh, a nice integrated system could be a nice thing to have. That may be something we'll have to take a look at together here soon. And that's a great idea for another show. Fair so absolutely. folks, if you use a grandfather and you use their fermentation system, let us know in the comments below. If you are, have questions about any of these fermenters that we've gone over, let us know in the questions below. We'll get back to you. We'll give you our thoughts and our opinions. If you're not subbed yet, hit the like and the sub and the bell notification. That will tell you when we do something new. Uh, we have videos for you every week, give you our take on not just craft beer and home brewing. Uh, we're going to weasel into spirits here pretty soon too. So keep an eye out on that. Um, that's going to be eye-opening and I'm pretty excited about that. But uh, that'll do it for us today. Thanks for watching. Have a great beer and uh, cheers. cheers.